Welcome to The Tippy Top, the podcast that helps entrepreneurs succeed by sharing best practice and creating alignment with investors. You'll hear from seasoned entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and industry professionals. The Tippy Top helps you learn vicariously because you simply don't have the time to learn every lesson through the School of Hard Knocks. A warm welcome to fellow VC, Matthew Holding. Thanks again for being on the show. Thanks. It's great to be here, Alex. Great. No, re real pleasure. And uh, just for everyone's benefit, Matthew and I met at the Mountside Ventures party at Bar Elba this summer 2021. And for those of you who know Matthew, you'll know that he's a real ninja networker and one of the most sincere people that you'll ever meet. And Matthew is not short of talent in multiple facets throughout his life. And uh, to do it justice, Matthew, do you want to give us uh, a proper introduction to yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Alex. It's very kind of you. Um, so, yeah. So, like Alex said, we met at the Mountside Ventures party, I think earlier this summer, maybe around July. Um, uh, obviously, hit it off there, had some nice drinks. Um, before that, I was basically at a, a fund called Midven, which is the Midlands Engine Investment Fund, which is geographically confined investments uh, with the British Business Bank, European Union Regional Development Fund, and the European Union Investment Bank as LPs, as well as private funds. We got acquired by Future Planet Capital. And shortly after that, I moved to UFP FinTech, which we're rebranding now to Systema. And um, I basically headed the ops there. I worked closely with, um, with the CIO and the CEO. And um, we're focused on kind of first second check, super early stage investments in fintech. Uh, we had many wins like Revolut, a plaza in Mexico, um, yeah, quick delivery in Nigeria, and, and many others, Yapoli and Weaver, you may be familiar with in UK. Um, and yeah, super happy to be here. And uh, yeah. Great. No, thanks very much. I mean, th those are some good wins, I must say. So I didn't, didn't know about that. Wow. Great. So we're really going to draw upon Matthew's experience and his passion and knack for networking and really understanding people. And that's really informed our three main topics of the show today. And what we have is number one, how to navigate the VC world. And you don't get anyone better placed than Matthew, I'll tell you that much. Number two, the do's and don'ts of pitching. Yes, it's been done a lot of times, but is it ever done well? Well, you'll find out from Matthew. And then a new world order. Nice people finish first. So contrary to popular belief, and we are here to lead that change. And again, you, you've got one of the nicest people that you will meet now. Let's stick on number one, how to navigate the VC world. So in terms of navigating the VC world, as I said, Matthew, you're probably the best at it. How do founders get as connected and as targeted as you and on this you know, really difficult journey of navigating the VC world in order to get the fundraising for your startup, not just at the early stage, but throughout the run, rounds? Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a really, really good question, Alex. And there's lots of ways I can take that. Um, I guess in terms of my intro, I probably should have done it more justice. I, I was a founder beforehand. So my, my dad was an entrepreneur um, in, in the Far East. So uh, he's actually originally from England and he moved over before he met my mum. And uh, we, he was in food tech, more of a lifestyle business, but he never raised from VCs. I, I actually wasn't aware of what a VC was, um, but I saw him trying to set up companies and he moved to Thailand as a result and saw the ups and downs very early on. That really inspired me growing up and I saw how powerful networks were. And um, when I came to Birmingham for university, um, I, I actually started attending a lot of kind of the Venture Fest, you know, West Midlands, all these different events here, as well as in London, you know, you're familiar with the, the tech weeks that they have. And I saw how, how advantageous they were in terms of how you can meet all the, whether it's VCs, uh, limited partners and funds, as well as you know, potential co-investors, which is super helpful if you're a VC. And as a founder, meeting other founders, whether different sectors, right, and um, entrepreneurs in different stages of life, late stage, like Series B plus, and have raised a lot of rounds, or they're repeat founders. So you meet, you meet so many people in the ecosystem. Um, and that's why I valued 
um, you know, going out to physical in-person events, obviously with Corona and the pandemic, that made it really difficult. There has been pros and cons. We've been quicker on deals. I've been able to meet entrepreneurs that I haven't seen in person, you know, all the way across the world in like Latin America uh, and the Middle East. Um, um, however, I, I guess just for the founder's perspective, uh, it, it's, it's a very difficult one because most entrepreneurs or first time founders, like I was back at university, aren't familiar with the, the VC landscape or invest, investment landscape. Um, you're also not aware that funds have investment theses. So you think to yourself, they're almost a bank. They have a lot of money. They're here to just give me cash because my idea is amazing. And of course, you're going to think that you're biased as, a, as an entrepreneur, you're a human being. Um, and you don't think about tiny things like fund mechanics. That's something you're not aware of, of course, right? You know, you're, you're not thinking about um, the vintage of the fund. Are they winding down the fund? Have they gone beyond their investment period? Um, you know, is this the right fit? You know, there might be a late stage investor who wants X amount of revenue. Um, you know, and there's, there's also tiny nuances we'll go into, you know, like no more than X amount of founders, no husband, wife teams, there's different nuances. So I guess don't take it to heart um, if you're not a right fit for those, um, the, the, the investors, right? Um, how, do they, how do they get connected and targeted? Um, I guess I'm quite opportunistic and I think most people should be and, and entrepreneurs tend to be, right? They're <laughs> taking on a master market or reinventing one. Um, I use LinkedIn, to be honest, and I, I just kind of see how I can add value to people and how they can add value back. Obviously, you don't want it to be one-sided. Um, and um, you just constantly... I've worked at it for quite a while, but I, I think everyone should do that. Keep an Excel, keep a, keep a list and see how you can be helpful to someone, um, whether it's introductions, and just see... Um, you know, what your place is in the ecosystem, um, whether it's helping with deal flow, um, um, helping founders raise like almost like a, a broker or a bank, investment bank. Um, th there's many ways you can see yourself being useful to someone, um, you know, so I think take the punt is, is what I'd say. Great. No, valuable advice. And it feels like, you know, that that's part of a wider career. If I'm an entrepreneur and I've started a business, that it's a cracking business. And I want to try and fast track that process. I've been a, maybe a bit lazy on my networking. How do I plug into those networks? Or who do I, do I pay someone? Or what's the easiest way to actually you know, get this knowledge and, and, and network? Oh, <laughs> there was anything controversial. You can obviously pay people. Um, there are you know, a lot of introducers in this world. I've got a friend who is developing a flying car company of all things. Right. And, um, he's in, uh, he was in Dubai and they were approached by a family office, but someone represented the family office who would take a 5% fee on anything they fundraise or, or raise for their, for their, um, startup. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fundraising shouldn't be underestimated. And I think, you know, the good rule of thumb is raise every, 12 to 18 months, 18 months was what I've been recommended. And, uh, you know, that's like a six month plus process of persuading investors to, to come in and join your board and invest in your company. And it's a, it's a long, long journey. Um, it, it works both ways. You need to be very careful how you do deal or assess um, the investors you want into your team because um, they're going to help you shape the business and grow. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I'd, personally speaking, I'd be more resourceful. I think if you're a bootstrap founder and you're, you're being very um, sensitive with the cash, there's no need to pay. You might have any of these who'd be able to help you, but I think it's better to go let people know who you are, you know, go to exhibitions that are um, um, relevant, right? And, and just put your face out there. Just don't be, don't be afraid, is what I'd say. Mm. Um, you know, not... I, I, t I tend to stay at the end of events and see who's around because um, I think it's seeking opportunity and, and absorbing value, right? Um, that's that's how I, that's mm -hmm. what I'd say to them as founders. Uh, I know it's very difficult, and you're, you you've got a company that you're managing, you've got employees, etc. But I think you should equally set aside time to to meet other founders who might actually introduce investors they know. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a massive spider web in the VC world, and everyone knows someone. Like mm -hmm. I actually spoke to the, the British Business Bank, um, BBB, last week, and it was Ryan Cartwright. He said he actually knows the Development Bank of Wales, and um, I thought that was quite funny. It's just, everyone knows someone in between. Mm -hmm. There'll be a mutual connection somewhere. 
Absolutely. Now, well said. Get out there and don't be afraid. Now, touching on something you mentioned earlier, talking about rejection and, and funds coming to the end of their cycle or you, know, you not being within their thesis. Either way, rejection hurts. Um, and I don't think founders typically understand these things. Do you want to just elaborate on that? Like why it might not be the case that your startup is bad or that you're uninvestable? Talk us through the dynamics. Yeah, sure, sure, Alex. Actually, just tagging on to, to the previous question, I'd like to say it sounds very simple what I'm saying, and it doesn't sound necessarily, you know, it might be like profound news, right? But it's just get it, you know, just go do it, right? It's be hungry, let that be conveyed, your passion, and just, you know, life is so short, just go go do it. Go stay at the end of events, go to as many as you can, network like crazy is what I'd say. And um, it's the, it's easy to hear someone say it, but in my opinion, just do it. It's the action that counts. Uh, but yeah, back, back to your question, Alex, on rejection. Yeah, it does hurt, of, of course. And um, what does it mean to founders who are rejected? What's a play? Um, having sat on the VC side and the investment side, you learn to have empathy for, for both sides now. Um, as, as an entrepreneur, I've been rejected many times by investors and you can take that to heart, right? You, usually they might give a very blank general um, reply, like pass, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, not a fit for our funds. Um, you know, we've got a conflict of interest with another startup we've invested in. There's, there's many factors. Uh, of course, entrepreneurs will always ask for a reason. And then there's VCs on Twitter who say, you know, that's what makes us have founder empathy. We'll actually give a, a proper response, right? <laughs> and um, what, what does it mean? So there's many things at play. I, I wouldn't take it too hard. And, you know, I, I read a, a, an article where it said um, um, the Canva founder was rejected 80 times. J.K. Rowling was also rejected many times. And, of course, all these people will be kicking themselves. But in terms of a fund... You have to understand, you know, let's talk about the fund mechanics side. They might have deployed the last ticket they can ever do. Um, they have maxed their allocation um, to the amount of startups they want in their portfolio. There's, there's many things like that because it is a fund, right? It's a, it's a fund in the buyer side of finance. Um, they are there to deliver a return to their LPs. And you're looking for VC backable, scalable companies. And you might not be VC backable or, or investor, um, you know, attracted to investors. Um, your business might be successful and revenue generating and you, you'll probably do very well, but it's not appealing to the, you know, B2B SaaS unicorn hunters out there, right? Um, I think the second side is, um, I actually heard from uh, an old fund manager friend of mine, Giovanni, and he said to um, a few portfolio companies, as well as um, in, uh, companies we were looking to take to IC, you know, if we do reject you, it isn't because we don't think you're good enough. We only have space for one, and there's three of you at the top. You know, top space. Uh, we can only do one of you uh, at this time of the year because we've already maxed out our deployment amount for you know this financial year. Um, and there's there's other things like that that come into effect, right? Um, so it's not because they don't like your company. It's it's because there might be logistical issues behind the scenes that you're not familiar with. Mm. Um, it's also very difficult in terms of, you know, when you say, well, what's that play? It, you know, there might be a lot of people, like associates and, you know, partners and directors who, who love the company, but the majority of the IC might not like it. So you have to also realize there's a, there's a huge amount of people, it's not just one or two who make the key decision, and they might have a disagreement or something might come up uh, that would stop the investment from happening. And now this has happened a few times uh, we had we actually had founders pass um, IC, and then on the flip side, you know, they turn around and say we don't want to take your money. Um, so it happens both ways, and um, things happen during time, right? The revenue starts going up, but then like the valuation they're getting um, on the, on the fund manager side as a VC, there, there might be other factors like uh, a portfolio companies entering that space. Um, that I, th I think for founders, you have to get used to the idea that you're selling to shareholders, stakeholders constantly trying to help people realize your vision, um, you have many no's more than yeses. I think that that's also an important lesson to realize you shouldn't relax and take it, take a break. You should, it actually should employ you to push harder. And mm -hmm. um, if you're in like buy now, pay later, and that's, that's a trend that was around a year ago and Khan made it famous, 
you know, you're going to have many people doing that in other countries. You should be the first one there, ideally, who sees the opportunity and, and, and runs with it before someone mm. else does. Because um, it really is a race. You're not the only founder in the world, right? Mm. And there are infinite amount of funds. Mm. Yeah, no, very well, wise words. And I was just thinking as you were talking, I was thinking about with a, a CV and job applications. And for anyone who's applying for a job now, I mean, this I don't know the stats, but it feels like people are applying for between 200 and 500 jobs on average to get one yes. The thing is, you only need one yes. And you don't know all the mechanics going on behind the scenes, whether the role is going to be filled internally. And I think there needs to be that understanding of VC. It's not about you. It doesn't mean your CV is bad. It's just not a fit at this time. And you might be the one who turns the fund down. So, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I hope that happens for, for some of you. Now, in terms of investor relations, how important is it? And what are, what are the tests that VCs are applying? Sure. So I think we're talking from the the entrepreneur's perspective. And I think we've um, we've had our own private discussions about the town we Alex. So, yeah, how important is investor relations? Now, every fund will have their own um, style of you know taking up the information rights and requesting information such as you know job creation data, um, new jobs created. D- depends on the LPs, of course. You know, diversity metrics, revenue. Um, you know, other KPIs that, that, that they want to look at every month. We, we do this to our founders um, and we, we make it clear up front before we invest, you know, welcome to the family. This is what we expect. This is monthly updates and this is what we, we would like to see. Um, how, why is it important and how is it important? Um, it, because, of course, communication. Some of them won't go to board meetings, your investors. Um, you know, it is really a team game. Um, you know, your your VCs are buying shares in your company. It's in both of your interests for the company to do well. And you need to be transparent with communication. You will have to be anyway with, with shareholders agreements and other documents that, and when legals are con- concerned, you will have to share that information anyway. Uh, and which is why, kind of going back to the previous questions on VC, when you're mapping the ecosystem, make sure you find the right VCs, whether it's by portfolio company, you've heard good things about these investors, what they can do for you. You probably respect what you've seen them do, um, like Hoxton and the Deliveroo. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of people obviously compliment us on our investments as well, and that, that attracts deals as well. So be conscious of those things. Um, and in terms of the test VCs apply, every fund's very different. I've, I've heard, I'm not going to name names, but I've heard people say, you know, not more than X amount of founders. I don't back founders from this background. Um, I like brothers who are founders, you know, because they know each other very well, co-founders. I don't like husband, wife teams, you know, it, it gets into kind of the very specifics of human nature. Um, there's, there's some like RLC um, who, who would, so I've got a friend there, he would, he would look at people driven factors, personality driven factors. Now, I don't personally invest in teams. We like product market fit and markets. So we're very driven by Don Valentine and, and his kind of thesis we like the products, so we come from that kind of perspective. Others kind of invest in teams and, and uh, probably not credentials, but they look at characteristics, you know, are they, are they introverted, extroverted, are they kind, etc. you know, things like that. And I'm not going to try to swear or anything, but there's other things that, you know, we look at as red flags. Um, and this comes from, you know, other investors too. Things like, you know, can I have a pitch deck? No, you can't have a pitch deck. Uh, ghosting. Um, you know, bad one-liners can't explain um, their their company or business. Uh, you know, aggressiveness, uh, too long didn't read. Uh, so many TLDR communication. Um, you know, always making excuses, very slow to respond to you. That's what Sam Altman talks about. You know, the wrong emphasis, um, maybe dishonesty, and you've. I, I, I don't typically do that kind of founded background checks. I know some people do. Um, and you know, sometimes take that with a pinch of salt because I've had that recently with a with a port co that we just backed, and I was a bit surprised because I did not have that experience <laughs> at all. I actually really like that founder, um, and I've seen this happen before in other funds. So you know, uh, but it is a very small world, so you do have to listen to people. And um, you know, of course, in in the investment world and startups, 
you're looking to change the world. So you're going to have people who are very ambitious. Um, but I mean, once you have invested and it's not being difficult, yeah, that is a huge issue because in follow on rounds or um, when we're attracting co-investments for, or in later rounds, um, when we're going to, as the investor on your behalf as a founder, talk to other investors and say, mm. hey, you know, Development Bank of Wales, you know, I've got this company that's a fintech or, or whatever, repeat mm. founder, do you want to back it, Alex? Like, I, I wouldn't be incentivized to help because you're not nice to me uh, or you're horrible. But what, we'll come on to what niceness means. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it's just being, don't be a, you know, a negative person who I don't want to work with. I don't want to work with someone who's just constantly causing hurdles and obstacles mm. uh, and not letting us realize our vision, you know, mm. just kind of get out of the way. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we're trying to help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Well said. Now, uh, coming on to part two in terms of the do's and don'ts of pitching, where a lot of this stuff starts that you spoke about, the pitch, it feels really misunderstood. What is it really about? Yeah. <laughs> Many, um, so I've, I've been in accelerators, I've you know, helped create, like, well, helped with kind of creating one here, actually, mm -hmm. and um, been involved with the FIA University. I think there's no hard science to it. There's no objective, like this is exactly what a pitch should be. And, and people put so much emphasis into a pitch. And with, with my fund, we emphasize the pitch deck. We want to understand the business. So let's take it really kind of far back to what a pitch is. The idea of a pitch, I'm not going to say elevated pitch, I don't really believe in them, but in a short amount of time or whatever amount of time it takes, your job is to give a quick, not quick, but um, let's say a coherent and um, effective message to investors so that they can understand what you are doing. Um, what you are doing is things like, what is the product? What is the competition? What is the market you're going after? What are you doing? What's the problems in this market that you're addressing? What is currently being done? Um, you know, and you can talk about team, et cetera, and your pitch deck will do that. The idea of a pitch is to capture the, invest, the, the, the investor's attention. Now, we see thousands. We see probably 10,000 a year. I know Andreessen sees 2,000. You know, many VCs see many deals per year. You probably have a lot of inbound. So, you know, and we're used to seeing patterns. We, we see the same thing. It's not pattern recognition. You have to kind of stand above a kind of signal over noise, like, like Musk will say, right? And you need to capture our attention to want to talk to you. The job of the pitch deck or the pitch is to get the conversation going. For, for us, it's pitch deck, then the kind of initial discussion, whether it's a phone call or face-to-face, -face, and then the investment decision. And in those amount of times, you need to convey to us what this is about. What are you building? Um, why do you need the money? What's the pre-money, you know, the raise, et cetera? Um, and, you know, what is it something I don't know what's, what's going on in the market? Educate me. Tell me what's why you're better 10x better than your competitors and then we'll have that you know investment discussion to ic um if you have a structured investment process as a vc the associates or analysts um in the kind of initial contact phase will be writing everything down and capturing as much information key metrics like you know cac ltv when i say cac it's cost of acquisition of a customer um revenue growth what is that looking like what is the product and um that will be used to help make an investment decision and sell to their other uh, kind of investors in the team, whether it's a principal or an associate. They can escalate it higher and higher um, to the consideration point of um, yes or no, here's a term sheet, let's take it to investment committee. Um, that's the job of a pitch. Now everyone kind of goes, oh, I've got to make this amazing pitch deck and oversell myself, 100 pages. No one's going to really look at that. And, um, you know, you don't overcomplicate it. Really, um, what we're looking for is product market fit and strong insights into the into the to the market. You know, that's a hot market. Ideally, that's growing like crazy, um, and we want to see that you understand it. Uh, that's what we're looking for. Other VCs will have their own thing. Um, so th that's the job of a pitch. It's your job to capture the capture the attention. Well said. And I like how you touched on the the mechanics of the VC process and approval process and the escalations because a lot of people don't have the insight into that they just you know see the the vc that's dealing with them in front of them but meanwhile there's a lot that happens in the background and 
Uh, but you obviously need that champion who's going to go and fight the fight for you when you don't have a voice in that investment committee room. And we'll come on to that. Now, what happens if the pitch goes down like a lead balloon? Either you know you just weren't feeling it that day, the, the connection wasn't right. Is that kind of the end or is there a way to salvage it? Uh, yeah, well, I, I guess it really depends on the, um, uh, like, like, like the investment mechanics again for a fund. Sometimes, you know, not everyone in the IC will have seen the entrepreneur pitch or even meet the entrepreneurs. I know in my previous fund, we actually had the entrepreneur pitch again and the, 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 the investment committee would have read uh, an investment paper that I would have written or someone in my team would have written to kind of recommend the investment. And then the questions would come up maybe during the pitch. Um, so why would it go, why would it fail basically? For, for me, so, you know, the current fund I'm at, we're, we're really quick. Um, you know, we, we actually say, see the pitch deck, just explain the idea. And sometimes go on the whiteboard and explain. And what we're looking for is insights. And we want to see that they think we like intelligent founders, right? Mm. And um, we like the hungry founders. And you, and you see the, what goes down like a lead balloon, probably, people who were entrepreneurs who really stumble at questions um, who, who probably oversell themselves and have a rehearsed pitch. Then you ask them questions, critical analysis, right? Classic, you know, investor questions. And they clearly haven't thought of the risks or, um, you know, the, the responses properly. And that's quite disappointing. Um, that, that loses comfort for us to even give them capital to even invest. So that's why I would go down. Um, in my previous experiences, why would it go down? Uh, why, why would a pitch fail? I'm trying to think of a few examples. Um, I mean, pre, it, it most likely at IC, most of the investments go through unless something horrible comes up. Mm. Like, uh, um, I don't know, like the fact that they've been embezzling funds. Like we actually had that and it was embarrassing for LP, which is public money, as, as you know. Um, and um, Things like paying themselves to service companies and not being transparent about that. Um, you know, that should come up in due diligence process, but it didn't. Um, you know, making sure uh, you know, that we had to keep signing NDAs and keep head headlocking all the time. That's not a good sign for the future of this company because if it's that difficult now, imagine 10 years of this. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of the red flag, it's like dating, you know, red flags that you kind of observe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well said. Um, now I was thinking about the, the NDAs and as you say, if you can't even agree an NDA within two weeks, well, it's going to be a long ride. And, and the same goes for term sheets. You often see a really protracted process and you think, well, we're not even at the legal process yet. How long is that going to take? Another six months or what? So uh, exactly. yeah. now my next question, and, and you've partly answered it already. Um, if the pitch goes really well, what, how much bearing does that have on the final investment decision? If you nail that, is it kind of like, well, 80% chance you'll get the money or how does it work? Well, it really depends on the investors you speak to, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I was sat in this kind of demo day and some, I, I remember seeing this investor come up. He wasn't a very experienced investor, to be honest with you, but walked up to the, to the guy who was pitching and went, oh, you did a really good job, buddy. Where can I send my check? And I was just like, Okay, int interesting. Um, <laughs> that company actually went to fail. So, <laughs> but uh, let's park that to the side. Uh, how, how much does it influence the final final investment decision? Now, like I said, your IC or most of them wouldn't have seen the first pitch, mm. and the the best entrepreneur doesn't mean they're the best pitcher. Um, neither does the fact you know, that they have the best pitch deck. Like you know, Revolut, I've seen the first deck. I've seen the Facebook Facebook first deck. I've seen um, many companies that have hadn't had the most impressive pitch deck. Mm. On the flip side, I've seen some amazing pitch decks, but just rubbish companies. And the saying is, you can't polish a turd, right? <laughs> um, and the but pitch can, does have a. <laughs> you, can, you can roll it in glitter. I heard the other day. <laughs> yeah, and some people really like that, right? So they'll back that anyway. <laughs> Um, and invest but uh in terms of the pitch yeah it would probably make me and it's not necessarily the pitch itself it's also 
how you respond to my questions and as an entrepreneur do i want to back you do i believe in your vision do i believe in the, com the company do i believe in your product and that would give me more motivation to push you up um into my ict and make the investment decision i've, I've had this before and actually one of the, the best deals in the midlands and we passed on it even before i could even say the pitch was amazing or even in also in another case invite the entrepreneur for a for a um, you know, discussion. Um, and that was because, you know, the, the, the investors were too emotional. Um, whereas where I'm at now, we, it's not about emotion, right? And uh, I think that's, it works much, much better for me. Um, and I think that's why the returns are very good. Um, but yeah, I mean, the pitch obviously has to be, has to be great. And I think a good dialogue is what I'm looking for. Um, make sure that the pitch deck on, and the pitch captures the attention to get your foot in the door and then have a dialogue with the investor. Um, a pitch deck will not itself get you 2 million pounds of investment. There are occasional times when this does happen. Like I know a fund in India that backed the repeat founder because they already knew them. You know, 2 million pounds, no deck. I mean, we've done investments pre-deck as well. Um, but those are rare kind of circumstances, ex exceptions, right, to the rule. Um, I think you should still have a, a decent pitch, keep, the short, keep it straight to the point, keep it poignant, um, be effective with everything you say, be, be critical of your, what, whatever you're saying, make sure you've thought carefully about everything you're doing. Um, don't lie, be transparent about numbers. If you don't know, don't pretend you know, cause we'll find out. And you know, that's what I appreciate in people. And if, if you show that you're easy to work with as a founder, um, then it'll probably influence the investment investment decision. And mm -hmm. I think something you mentioned just now, having someone back you in a in the room is absolutely important. I, I did this in IC recently. I, I was I had compliance and the the opposition kind of you know playing devil's advocate and I just, you know, you have to fight back. And mm -hmm. the founder won't always fight for themselves. So you have to fight for them. So it's important that you're on the same page and aligned and listen mm -hmm. both ways, whether you're the investor or the founder. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and to your point, like if you do secure investment off a pitch, do you really want to take that money? Because it's saying a lot about the investor and your potential outcomes. So uh, let's, let's move on to uh, a new world order, though. Nice people finish first, which you've touched on because you've said, you know, be honest, be transparent, get a good dialogue. But I want to talk a bit about leadership. And you, and you talk a lot about leadership. And I know it's something you're quite passionate about. And no doubt you draw a lot upon your experiences at the British Army, um, and you haven't actually mentioned too much about that, but do you want to tell us a bit about that and a bit about your thesis on leadership? Oh, Alex, that was meant to be a secret. I'm going to have to kill you now. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, um, I mean, we could take it back to what a nice person is, but I think the descriptions I've given you um, hopefully show you who I'd like to work with. And like, I think the, 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 the word nice has been distorted. I think many words are distorted by today's society. You know, I think society has gone a bit on the crazy side of things, but that's another conversation that we had. Let's talk about leadership then. So uh, right now I'm a reserve army officer in the Royal Logistic Corps. And there's, there's a, a really good saying um, in the British army, uh, well, especially for Santos, where we go, you serve to lead, you put other people first in your team. Um, and the importance of this, of course, is contextual, but in the army is when you're a platoon commander or a troop commander, you have a lot of soldiers looking up to you to make decisions. They're going to have to listen to you and their life will be at risk. Um, I was just back from training in Beckingham last weekend and we had to do some exercises and um, the officer there, the second lieutenant, you know, sir, we addressed him as, would um, have us walking down kind of all these farm lanes and we had to keep like 10, 15 meters apart in case of artillery fire. And you think like, this is, this is the real deal. This is crazy. My life is in someone else's hands. Um, and of course, I don't want to go to war, um, but you know, I, you, le you learn to trust someone else um, and accept your position. And this guy might be younger than you. Um, you might not respect that person. That makes it very difficult to trust them as a leader. But when you see them on the field, laying themselves down, you know, one of them, my, my basher, my tent collapsed, 
and, and in the midnight just use my cutlery to put it in and redesign my redesign my tent with the captain these guys are super high ranking officers who could just let me suffer and sleep in the cold but they they took some time out at the end of a long day and and helped me and that inspires me to do the same back for them um it's that equal it, it's you know you want to work with someone you respect and you want to work with someone who does serves by example and leads that's what i like and, and leadership's not about being a massive you know tool and shouting at people and having you know like the alphas of the world you know whatever that is now um massive egos and just you know you're not going to keep talent if you do that um you're not fair as a person i don't respect you and you'll be deserted and <laughs> that's the worst thing that can happen in for soldiers right and it's the same for companies uh, a lot of people in the army do end up in the in the, you know in the, in the private commercial world and um you know you know i i, I don't see them ever wanting to work for someone who who wouldn't put others first or be respectable so it, it's really how do you it's you know dale carnegie how do you win friends and influence people so people want to be with others who stimulate their mind make them think make them better and those are who you should be with and that's who i would say is a leader someone who's strong face it in the face of adversity someone who you want to emulate and you respect them um might be countercultural to kind of serve others below you but that that is, I think, what we truly value uh, in uh, in leaders we, we want to have. Um, and so how does that apply to founders? You know, mm. best founders I, I know, you know, they're not famous for being nice, but we respect them because that in the face of really difficult and challenging times, they and they've been told no many times, they will build one of the massive companies that leaves a massive legacy. Everyone would have heard of it. They're saving the world or changing how things are done <laughs> are really complicated and they've done something that no one else has done and that's why i like working in entrepreneurship and you know being in the vc and backing these people it's because they are, they probably have chips on their shoulders i think most of us have um and you know they come from difficult backgrounds and they'll build something that everyone said was impossible and said you're just too stupid etc and you know I saw this really interesting tweet where it said in, in America, it's all about where you're going. Whereas in UK, it's like, where have you come from? And I really want to challenge that because I think, you know, though I'm in the kind of hierarchical, traditional organization like the British Army, I think it shouldn't be about where you're coming from. It should, we, should, we should be encouraging those who want to go somewhere and better themselves. And I think that's what a good leader does. He, he, champion, he or she champions those below them to want to better themselves and um, improve themselves. Therefore, better communication, better company, de 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 delivers a better product and service to the customers and beats everyone else, right? And I think that's what that's what I respect. Yeah, no, hugely valuable. And you just think about a lot of young tech founders as they might be employing people older than them. So those leadership qualities, uh, you know, have to be present right from the outset and you, as, as a very experienced investor, that's what you're looking for above all else. I, I'll tell you what, let, let's, um, what would be really helpful is, yeah. what about if you talk us through how, uh, you know, if with it, not, not necessarily a nice founder, but a, a good founder, I mean, you get good people, you get bad people. And I think in, in my experiences in, in old, the old world, you could rule by hard power, you could be hard, you could be, uh, you know, and, and you would get your way. Um, and I feel like that's changed. And do you want to just talk us through how, you know, good founder conduct leads to good investment outcomes if you are fundraising and lots of other things in terms of the success of your business and so forth? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's probably a helpful way to kind of classify these, these, these terms. Um, a good a good founder so in my own portfolio companies and i'm not going to go to you like names or anything but the ones who are responsive you know we send them we, we use whatsapp sometimes we send them information decks you know request documents uh like i said you know i'm trying to show that i can add value and i'm helping them when they have to get something over the line over a certain you know, eta or deadline and the same for us and the ones who are communicative I value the most and I can trust them. And I think over time we begin to trust them. Now, you know, I'm sure we've all been hurt by someone and 
um, relationships can really crumble very quickly. We, we know that you do, you do nine things amazing, one thing bad, and you're always remembered for the one bad thing. Um, that's just human nature. It's very, it's a sad reality of the world we live in. Um, so I think the most valuable thing is just transparency and communications. Um, and when you're a founder and a, and a VC, both of you have many things going on. A founder would be managing a lot of employees and uh, tasks every day with the ops of the company, staff, you know, C-level executives and what have you, and your, your investors. And the, the VCs are the same. We have LPs who invest in our funds. So we, and we also pitch to them. <laughs> we, we also have a lot of entrepreneurs that we work with and we try to guide them strategically and help them gear up for the next fundraise and give them advice, introduce them to you know, good talents or what have you um, and give advice, right? And uh, the ones who kind of are aligned and communicate them, but they don't like something, they say it, that is much more effective. And I, th I think the co connotation with nice has been kind of weak. You know, it's it kind of, not not trying to hurt people's feelings by saying the truth and um that's not authentic you're actually lying to people and that's why they finish last and i, I think and that's not to say you know nice people are bad it's just that there's a particular precise definition we need with what it means to be nice and why they finish it last um i think with reputation that's super important this is another thing we discussed um, you can't hide anymore. You know, we've spoken about the kind of old financial world, the old way of doing things, the social media now. Um, people do references, you know, about landscape VC. Um, I've, I've seen people say, uh, which is true about my previous fund, it takes too long to do anything. <laughs> and, you know, when you're running a company and you're, you're not responding in a quick enough time, you, that's just being, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to swear, but <laughs> that's just being impolite to them and uh, not fair you're not considerate of their time and we've actually had compliments when we reject founders they go oh, amazing that you responded so quickly uh you know the, that founder could have been absolutely abusive and gone crazy but they turned a, a negative into a positive and i actually respected that i actually had the th thought to actually go back to them and say you know what how can i help <laughs> mm. um and that's what i valued um people like that that you want to work with life is so short that that's what you value and communication being appreciative to those around you um now not every individual is different i, I realize that but you have to really consider what drives you as a person um mm. you know there's an entrepreneur in, in my in my fund who wants to save the world and is doing a you know climate angle with fintech i totally respect him he's he's also sat on the investment side so he knows what we look for and he's always quickly responding ask for things to be done I was the ETA, and in fact, most of the founders we back are, are, are amazing. They they all ask me to do something, and I, I do it for them, and they'll do the same for me. And it's a relationship that's reciprocal, um, you know. And I think friendship for a very long time. Um, you know, I, I feel like I can go to them and ask them for advice on different things, even investment decisions. Mm. What do you think about the startup? Yeah. So, so that's what I really look for. You know, it's actually developing a relationship with with the founders. You know, we're not there all to be like, you know, come by and sing songs. But um, <laughs> I, I think it makes life easier for both of us when we're navigating uncharted waters and building a company that is just going to blow everything out of the, of the water, right? So mm. um, that's my personal kind of um, driver. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I, again, I was uh, thinking about something when you were speaking. I was thinking about, you know, the VCs, what are they doing? Basically, they deciding whether they're going to start you know, something as long as a marriage with you. So it's like this recruitment process, but you can't fire the employee and they probably and they can't leave if they want to go somewhere else. So, you know, that's quite daunting. You think, you know, a five year plus relationship, maybe 10. Um, and also, you know, you come to work as, as a VC, you've got your small team. But you're bringing this other person into your team, maybe 10 founders, depending on the fund. And you've got to work with these people day in, day out. And you're like, oh, you know, <laughs> is this someone I can pass the airport test with, which is a, a McKinsey test, I believe, you know, if you get snowed under at, you know, Ontario Airport, would you be able to spend 12 hours sitting next to this person or, or, or you know, not <laughs> lose the will to live? So, um I like what you said, life is short. And uh, so, yeah, that's why it's, it's yeah, 
nice to work with nice people. Let's put it that way. Exactly. I mean, I, I'll just tag on to that. Um, it's it's like this energy is right in the in the world. And um, mm. I, I was told some really good advice by a, a life coach that I knew. She, she mentors um, um, entrepreneurs. So shout out to Emma and uh, Emma Trace, and she's also John Lewis. Sorry, and she she also works with um, the New Entrepreneur Foundation, which is actually part of my background and how I got on VC, but that's a long story. Um, so, you know, she talks about something called like um, radiators and drains. And mm. you don't want to be around people who's very negative all the time and just drain your energy. Mm. And that can actually create a domino effect. I, first, I personally found in my personal life that I was unhappy and it was just draining and affecting work performance and how I sort started seeing the world, you know, when I was talking to LPs or other investors, you just lose motivation. You want to be around radiators who push you up, who want the best for you, who want to improve you, and you're aligned, same vision, similar outlooks on the world. You're there to do one thing, you know, get your mission done. That, that's, that's who you value. And, you know, when push comes to shove and tough times come in, they'll have you back. Yeah. Um, and that, that's actually what, you know, I hope to bring those learnings into the VC world from mm. the army. And I think, uh, yeah that's just something i wanted to plug in there it's it's the kind of be around people who who push you up and there's there's other sayings like you know the top five people you're close to is mm. who you become to be very careful who you're you're close with um and i think you should also be very careful about you know transactional relationships and i, I think vc is very much like that mm. um not always but it can be mm. and um you, you know when you're getting played <laughs> so i think it's important to be with people who have similar minds um and you know you don't want to be used if, if you're always doing something for them you get nothing back you know cut that mm. and there's no value but try to be with people who have a similar outlook and i remember you know we were on the the bar top in london we had really great discussions on you know leadership management people generally you know narcissism psychopathy <laughs> different kind of very difficult things you're not you, that, that we don't talk about on the side but you can tell it's going to affect you at work it's going to affect mm this long-term, you know, business you're trying to build. And it, it's, it's, it's something that the entrepreneurs aren't even, you know, appreciative of is that you're going to have someone on your cap table with shares in your company for a very long time. And mm. if, if you just sign the sheet, you know, that's a legal issue in itself. You're going to mm. have them there for a long time. And if you don't agree with anything and you're always fighting and bickering over nothing, mm. you know, it's, you know, tough, you know, luck, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just thinking about, you know, there's lots of startups or deals out there. There's lots of cash, lots of VCs raising funds. So there's lots there. And when you get a VC that just wants a deal and you when you get a founder that just wants cash, they're looking at it from the wrong aspect. They should be looking, can I work with this person? Can I build a relationship with them? And yes, they happen to have money, but it's a completely different focus. I, well, I actually don't see that a, a lot, actually, to be honest with you, Alex. Um, I, I've actually had a few times uh, an entrepreneur would come to me and say, uh, you know, can I do a due diligence check or talk to one of your port codes on, on, you know, of your founders to, to see what you're like. I find that very interesting because it flips the script. I'm not, I'm not seeing that a lot, though. Um, mm. But of course, you know, the bargaining chips in the favor of the VC, they're the ones with the cash that you need. Mm. Um, don't piss them off right uh uh and it, it's interesting we, we actually had a very difficult founder in the midlands uh, when i was in my london fund who, who threatened us many times and I, i'm not going to specific details but that was just an absolute nightmare that took months to shake off i think we're not even past it yet but um you know never going to work with that person i could have offered them introductions to, to investors but that's not going to happen anymore um and and the world is so small that word gets around uh, that if you're being unreasonable for the sake of being unreasonable, um, you know, it's karma, it's going to come back to bite you. So you cut your losses there, you know? So I think that's something that also has to be understood on, on both sides. Great. Uh, well said. Great. I'm going to try and summarize our discussion. So number one, in terms of navigating the VC world, uh, Matthew says, get out there and don't be afraid be hungry 
and network like crazy. And uh, if you get a no from a, a, an investor, it's not always about you. There's lots of other things at stake. And remember, when you're speaking to investors, always be transparent and concise with your communication. In terms of pitching do's and don'ts, the pitch is all about capturing the VC's attention. It's the start of a conversation. Um, and during the pitch, one of the most important things is not about having a really polished, well-rehearsed pitch or about a really polished deck. It's about being able to stand up to scrutiny when someone delves one layer deeper than the uh, what's on the facade. And um, yeah, remember, it's it's the start of a process. And if someone offers you money at a pitch, well, you're either very good or you perhaps shouldn't be working with that investor. And then in terms of nice people, finish uh, first, last, a couple of wise words there from Matthew, serve to lead, be your authentic self, be transparent, and above all else, when working with anyone, but particularly with investors, be responsive and be highly communicative. Uh, because that conveys trust and ultimately is going to lead to better outcomes. Matthew, uh, thanks again. Do you want to just tell us where we can find you online or one of these many events that you go to? Yeah, absolutely, Alex. Um, so I, I've got a Twitter account. Um, so it's at Holding Matthew. Um, mm -hmm. Also LinkedIn. I welcome many connections, <laughs> 20,000 plus now. Um, wow. And you know, emails as well. Um, I'm sure yeah, I'm at systema.vc or I'm at utdfirst.com. Um, I can provide that to Alex and it can be put on LinkedIn. But welcome yeah. anyone who wants to talk, um, even WhatsApp, but I won't get my number out now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, open to having discussions. If you want advice or anything, let me know. Oh, great. Very kind of I you. Think I think it's important to also reiterate, like kind of paying it forward. I think with Guy Kawasaki, mm. I think we didn't discuss it, but... Uh, that is something a friend of mine who's actually at McKinsey and I really agree on, agree mm. on, you know, it's this mentality in Silicon Valley of helping someone sometimes with nothing being expected back, but you know yeah. that they will help you out in the future. And, you know, you want to do that for people you, you value and you can see them helping you and you respect them. I mm. think that's also very important. It's like, um, it's also countercultural because someone would expect something back immediately. Mm. Um, but we're also very scared of being hurt because we, mm. I think many people have been in the world. So, it's being kind of considerate of that as well. You want to make good first impressions. Wise words. Great. Now let's uh, go into some quick fire Q&A and hear more about that. If you weren't doing VC, what would you be doing? <laughs> uh, good question. Uh, I personally love building, um, not building as in construction, but I love, I'm opportunistic. I, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I love building something. You know, I've done a lot of art and science. So I've thought about this recently, actually. Um, I'd love to be involved in uh, maybe a food tech co or something to do with kind of um, um, the environment using science, like biotech in the healthcare, solving in this issue, maybe like cancer research or regenerative medicine, longevity. Um, at the same time, I'd love to be building funds and trying to be working mm. with entrepreneurs who, who want to save the world. I think um, Corona gave us a lot of time to think about um, you know, be kind of a introspective with our thoughts or retrospective <laughs> and mm. whether it's regrets you have um, and just think about where the, where's the world going. And we've seen like Musk and these amazing entrepreneurs mm. like shining a light and saying, you yeah, know, watch me do it. And that's really inspired me. So I'd, I'd love to be an entrepreneur building a mm. company that is making a huge impact. And I think too, I'd carry on building funds that are in different verticals like biotech and like longevity and, um, maybe energy as well, like about nuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to be involved with charities too. And and um, I think I wouldn't go full-time army. I'm happy being kind of reserves at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I think just looking after, you know, the homeless, vulnerable people, um, you know, those who've suffered and you know, like backgrounds I can kind of probably empathize with. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be supporting them. And yeah, I think I think that's what I'd be doing. Wow, that's quite a list. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and, and an impressive one at that. I appreciate it, Alex. I know you, you want to build a, a tech company as well, doing, you know, save the world. So I think we all do. I think most VCs want to, you know, we don't like to sit idly by. We, we, also, we all want to make an impact and a, a difference. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, no, absolutely. And, and I was just about to say that, that you know, there's often this us and them, investors, entrepreneurs, and they're probably one and the same. Uh, you know, most VCs have a desire to do something entrepreneurial, whether that's an entrepreneurial, you know, in terms of the creating the fund or actually getting involved in and building a, a tech startup, as it were. Um, and um, similarly, most entrepreneurs I know, when they cash out, what do they do? They become investors and <laughs> they start investing in other startups. So they will, and, and, and hence the, the, the purpose of this podcast to try align those two people from the outset so we don't have to go on this convoluted journey um, just to end up at the same point. Um, now, I've got a couple more questions. Um, you're quite a social cat. Uh, what's your favorite London hangout locations? You always catch me at a Korean barbecue. I think it's, it's such a primal, interesting way to share part of my culture and just have, you know, a nice drink like soju, a nice barbecue. Everyone loves meat and vegetables. And, you know, just having a good time talking to people, um, you know, whether friends or it's business context. We do this a lot at, 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 my, at my fund. And I, I like to do it with entrepreneurs as well when they're about to fundraise or what, what have you. Um, so you'll see me at like a superstar Korean BBQ or, you know, Tossum Court Road or um, Corgi at, uh, around, uh, where is it, Malibu area. So mm. I, I tend to go to those places. Um, I don't really have a, the place to go. You know, you, you'll see me at events, but I don't have a favorite London hangout. I'm, I quite like Bermondsey, actually. So mm -hmm. south of London Bridge, uh, it's not far from where, where we're based in Cannon Street, you know, the square mile. Um, I like going to there because there's lots of kind of indie restaurants and cool mm. places to eat. You know, so you can see me there too. But other than yeah. that, busy work. <laughs> oh, hey. Fair enough. Uh, it sounds pretty cool. I should try it out. Now, uh, one final question. You, your, your best bit of advice for entrepreneurs? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a tough question. Best advice to entrepreneurs? Hmm. It won't be like a simple one liner that you, you can quote and put on Instagram and you know, remind yourself every day. But I think we're all in agreement. We have a lot of respect as investors for what you're doing. You're building a company. You've taken a lot of risk and you'll be handsomely rewarded when you become successful because of the power laws with share price. You know, it's called Matt's law, funny, funnily enough, Matt's rule. <laughs> um, but I think my best advice is... I think we all need this nowadays. It's, it's the encouragement just to carry on working extremely hard in the face of adversity. Um, don't take, you know, no for an answer is, is actually what I strongly believe in and the law of attraction. And I, I've, I've always kind of, the reason I've got my work, job and where I'm at actually, uh, aside from just the hustle, <laughs> is also by networking and talking to people, take, not taking no for an answer. I actually strongly believe um, you know, my, my parents come from sales backgrounds and I saw, mm. I saw my dad being motivated and just not taking no for an answer and he just constantly wait to get the deal done. Otherwise, there'd be no salary, no money at home. And I think living like that make you, makes you hungry. You know, and I had a friend who said, I'm not hungry, I'm starving. Yeah. That really is, is amazing, right? That guy anytime. And it's that mentality I think you need. And I think the advice is truly... Don't take no for an answer. Keep keep pushing. Um, like pretend you're gonna die tomorrow. <laughs> pretend mm. there's fire underneath you, and you're gonna be tortured if you don't get what you want. So keep fighting. Um, don't be a dick, but keep fighting and and try to realize um, the vision you have. Uh, and I think with time, what you're seeking will come to you. Beautiful ending to the podcast. So well said. Um, I can only thank you again for being on the show. It's been a, a pleasure as always. So thanks again for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me here, Alex. Love what you're building and uh, look forward to having you on my podcast one day, potentially. Um, let me know how I can help you too um, in terms of sharing this around. Uh, I look forward to, to seeing um, many more episodes. Congrats on everything you've achieved. Thanks very much. I look forward to joining your podcast in the near future too. So thank you. That's all for this episode. Keep tuning in for more exclusive content on how to succeed as an entrepreneur. Make sure that you follow the tippy top on all social channels, including Twitter, 
TikTok, Facebook, or now Meta, Insta, YouTube, with at the Tippy Top blog. And check out my website, thetippytop.com. And you can also find me, Alexander Lee, on LinkedIn. Until next time, keep pushing, and I'll see you at the Tippy Top. Cheers.